Hi, and welcome back to Community Hotline. My name is Monica Weitzel. We're here at Metro East Community Media in Gresham, Oregon. And my second guest tonight is Rebecca Nichols, who is the Executive Director of the Portland Women's Crisis Line. Welcome. Thank no you so much. It's nice to have you here, Rebecca. And I've wanted to have the, um, the PWCL yes. on here for, <laughs> for quite a while. You, I, you've been around for a very long time. Yeah, that's right. Tell, tell me a little bit, if you can, uh, about when, when you started. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I know you weren't around then, but um, <laughs> when, when you started, what, what the... Um, what was the impetus behind getting this organization going? Absolutely. Well, the Portland Women's Crisis Line was formed by a group of women in their early 20s in 1972. And from what I've been told, I've been lucky to meet a number of them, but from what oh. they've told me is that they really identified that there was no resources for survivors of sexual assault in Portland. And in 1972, <coughs> domestic and sexual violence were still somewhat new topics where people were starting to be willing to talk about them and kind of share their experiences. So at that time in Seattle, there was a nonprofit being formed called the Rape Relief Hotline. So these young women in Portland decided that they wanted to do the same thing, and so they created this nonprofit. So it was incorporated in 1973, so this is going to be our 40th anniversary oh, wow. this year. It's your birthday. That's right. It's our 40th birthday, a big one. Um, and then a couple years after the hotline began, um, they realized that they were getting calls from a lot of survivors of domestic violence as well. So then the crisis line expanded to serve survivors of both domestic and sexual violence. And in those 40 years, our phone number has stayed the same. Wow. And our core That's services amazing. have stayed the same. Yeah. So it, it, did the name stay the same? Was it called something else in the beginning? It was. When we were formed, it was the Rape Relief Hotline. And okay. then when the mission expanded, it became the Portland Women's Crisis Line. And then, you know, right now, though, what we are often told by folks who call us or community partners is that um, we're not just specific to Portland. People from mm. all over the state call us. And then we're not just specific to women because mm. we that know that. That's one of my questions. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, we know that survivors <coughs> of me. domestic and sexual violence come in every gender. And so we've actually kind of thought, is this the right name for us? Um, but for now, we're for the now, Portland Women's Crisis Line. But that, that may yeah. change. It might. As you, as you evolve. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, but that's something that back in the 70s, People didn't talk about men being, uh, or, or you know, or anybody, you know, except women being, possibly the victim of domestic violence right. or, or, or sexual assault. Right. And and so that's yeah, that's come out in the open, which is a good thing. Yeah, that people definitely. can talk about it. It's a bad thing that it exists, but it's yeah. a good thing to talk about it. Yeah. So how long have you been there, Rebecca? I've been the executive director for six and a half years, oh. and um, I've been doing work with survivors for about sixteen. So wow. it's kind of the only the only time. work I've done as a grown up is what? is this kind of <laughs> as a big girl. I mean, <laughs> well, that's uh, that you probably have some amazing stories that you could tell, and probably some disturbing stories. Sure. I would think. How, just personally, how do you how do you keep up with you know when when um, you're talking with people that have been victims of sometimes horrific things? Yeah. How do you keep your attitude up and keep you know a positive outlook on on things? Well, um, because I've done this work for so long, I've worked at various and volunteered at various organizations. And one of the things that I love about PWCL is that we have a very um, we talk a lot about social justice in the day-to-day -day work that we're doing. So we are talking with folks about really terrible situations and hard stories. And we're trying to provide them some hope and some options. And so even though um, it's really a slow process. We are helping folks every day end the violence in their lives. And so for me personally, I really need to celebrate those, those small successes. Um, and as the boss, I don't really get to work with survivors <laughs> that much right. anymore at all. Um, and so I get a lot of joy watching advocates um, kind of come into their own and feel really confident in the work that they're doing. And um, knowing that they're making a difference in people's lives and then by helping them do their jobs i'm helping making a difference in people's lives yeah. too so so that's tell what me keeps about me going. tell me about the advocates are these volunteers are these paid staff what well, how does that work and how many people do you have working there? We have 10 paid employees mm -hmm. and um, most of those are advocates. And uh, so they go through training to, they do. to get to the They do. And that then level. we have about um, 40 or so volunteer advocates as well. And we actually provide about um, 60 hours of training for all of our advocates, mm -hmm. paid or volunteer, before they're actually on the line. All of our advocates who we hire, um, we ask that they've already had about a year's experience working with survivors. Oh, and a lot of them actually were volunteers at PWCL. I was a volunteer at PWCL Is that right? That's how you 13 years ago. Wow. Yeah, so I took a break from the organization, but um, we hire a lot of our volunteers actually yeah. to work, that work makes at the perfect organization. Sense. Yeah. They know what they're getting into. They know they that it's something they want to do. <laughs> right. Now, 
you don't just counsel people when they're in crisis. Don't, tell me about your mission. There's, there are several branches of your, of your mission from what I saw on your website. Other things you do, and one of them I think was social justice. Was mm -hmm. that part of it? What, what, else, um, what else do you do at, at uh, the crisis line? Yeah, I think that you're um, thinking about our core values. Your core values, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. See, which, I think it's um, as part, as part of, of the mission, mission. but yeah. yeah, your core values, and, and, and I'm going to read them here because okay. they, this is what I wrote down. Empowerment mm -hmm. was one of them, social justice, dedicated service, community education, trust and unity. Mm -hmm. So tell me about empowerment first. What, what do you mean by that? Well, basically, um, the way that I always summarize it really quickly is that a survivor's choices define the strategy. Mm. So basically, we're here to provide options and information and then we're going to support a survivor's choices and but they make the choice they make the choice and sometimes people want us to tell them what to do yeah. and we have to say i'm not going to tell you what to do That's right, but you're empowering them right. by doing that right sure. but i want to but let's talk about what's going to happen if you choose this or choose this sure. and work through that and the reality is there aren't really enough, there aren't enough resources for survivors if they want to leave an abusive relationship. A lot of times survivors choose to stay in an abusive relationship. So sometimes when we're respecting someone's choices, we're also saying, I'm worried about your safety. Yeah. So that's your choice and I want to talk about how to stay as safe as you can if that's what, you, what you're going to do. Sure. Um, and maybe have a a backup plan Absolutely. if that doesn't work out. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a lot of backup I plans bet, involved. I bet there are. Yeah. I bet there are. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and social justice, you touched on that right. briefly, but how how do you work on social, social justice issues? Right. Well, that's a tough one for us because none of our funders actually pay us to do that. Mm. Um, so we're here to provide a social service, but what makes our organization work the way it does is when we focus that social service on the idea of changing society, changing ideas and attitudes so that people interrupt violence if they see it and they don't um, mm -hmm. perpetuate violence. Or look the other way. Absolutely. And, you know, yeah, that it they, isn't happening. Right. So that they know how to support survivors in their lives and they know how to call out if somebody's perpetrating in their lives as well. So a lot of our social justice is about kind of our philosophy with um, the belief that we're not going to end domestic and sexual violence unless we're ending other forms of oppressions. That we're not going to, violence against women will continue when we have racism in our country or homophobia. And so all of those things are related. And so part of our mission is to not just talk about domestic and sexual violence, but talk about what would equality look like across the board and how do we work towards that. That's a big, big it's undertaking. Big, yeah. <laughs> it is a big undertaking. Yep. Dedicated service. What, what are you referring to when you say dedicated service? Well, that really has to do a little bit with PWCL's legacy of being around as long as we have. A lot of people who you meet who do social, who does social work in Portland, they may have volunteered at PWCL over the last 40 mm -hmm. years. Um, so we are a group of folks who are really dedicated to the work that we're doing, and um, we really, as individuals, I think, believe in the mission and in the ultimate goal of ending domestic and sexual violence. How long do your volunteers usually stick around? What, is there, you know, do, is it something that you burn out on quickly or do? I think that you definitely can. Um, you know, one of the things that I often say to volunteers is that they're choosing, choosing to see the world differently mm -hmm. because you can exist without, you know, thinking that advertisement is sexist, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're talking about, you know, how all those things kind of chip away at, at women's safety and um, how they create sexism, then you have to be willing to kind of think about that in your own life. And mm -hmm. so, um, Kind of a wake-up call sometimes, sometimes, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, so some people, they go through our whole training and then never want to volunteer uh -huh. because it was enough. But they probably learned something they and learned got something out of it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so we ask all of our direct service volunteers to be with us for at least six months. And I don't know kind of across the board um, how long they stay, but I think that about 80% of them exceed what we ask of them. Oh, so they're still with cool. us an hour, or not an hour, a year. <laughs> a year later. A year yeah. later, two years later. And then, like I said, often they might actually get a job and, and end up working with PWCL. Good, yeah. good deal. Community education, that's sort of self-explanatory, but in what areas, how do you educate the community? Is it, is it um, do you actually go out and do workshops or anything like that? We do, yeah. We have a volunteer coordinator who kind of manages all those requests and she also works with a group of volunteers in a speakers bureau. Mm -hmm. And so our speaker bureau volunteers are, um, 
trained to talk a little bit about PWCL so they can go into a neighborhood association or a oh, faith okay. community and just explain what does PWCL do and what do you, how can you support it. And then they're also trained to provide education around domestic and sexual violence and then um, just how to advocate for survivors and how to make sure that people have the resources that they're hoping for. What about schools? Are you allowed to go, have you ever been allowed to go into schools and talk? Yes, yeah. yeah. Most schools are happy to have advocates come and talk about healthy relationships or dating violence. I would think, especially at the high school level, would be, I would think would be really important. Absolutely. Because a lot of, a lot of kids don't have boundaries. They don't know mm -hmm. what their boundaries should be right. and that kind of thing. And, and I don't think we do a, a good job relationship. teaching yeah. kids no, 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 <laughs> what a healthy no, relationship is. I don't think so like. either. Yeah. yeah, so we do go into schools. We have an advocate who works specifically with youth. And so um, that person has gone into the community and tried to just build relationships with schools. And we've actually also tried to provide services in high schools, and that's actually a little bit harder for us because um, we don't, our staff are not mandatory reporters unless they're a licensed uh, social worker or something, right. the equivalent of that. And so um, the schools would like us to be mandatory oh. reporters. So sometimes that's hard for us. Yeah, that yeah. would be difficult. Um, and the last one, trust and unity. That mm -hmm. seems sort of obscure What, what <laughs> as, as, as part of your core values. So right. what, what, what is that referring to? Well, when we created those core values, the agency was at a time where there was a huge leadership turnover. I had just started, and uh -huh. these values came out of a strategic planning process that we did in 2006. And so it was that was really about regrouping and okay. um, relying on each other. Trust and unity in each other. and Absolutely. You know, assuming good intent of our dedication to the organization and then also um, knowing that we can rely on each other. And so we're actually doing a strategic planning process again right now. It's and a huge undertaking. Know, isn't it? We, we just did that this year too. And it's <laughs> yeah. like, oh my goodness. It always seems to take a long time. And yeah. so we're actually revisiting that one around. You know, we've kind of accomplished the intention from 2006. What is this about now? Yeah. So it's really about supporting so that, each that other. May yeah. Next year, if I have you back on again, it may <laughs> say something new. different. Yeah. But you've been there six years, so obviously, you know, the trust in you <laughs> has worked out okay. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Now, now, um, you have uh, events periodically. Right. Mm -hmm. What do you have coming up soon? Well, we have our 40th birthday party. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> now, when does that take place? That's April 5th, so the first the first Friday of April. And April is actually Sexual Assault Awareness Month, so that's one of the reasons we chose that date because we were um, we the organization started to serve sexual assault survivors, and um, we have an event called Safety in Numbers every year. It's our annual auction and dinner, and so we're going to have Safety in Numbers. Um, to begin the evening and then we're going to have a birthday party after that. That oh, starts fun. at 8 o'clock. And for the birthday party, I mean, of course I want people to come to the dinner and the Sure, auction, sure. And where, is, where does that take it's place? It's at the Melody Ballroom. Okay. okay. And they have two ballrooms. So the dinner will be downstairs and then the after birthday party will be upstairs. And because, you know, I'm so excited to celebrate the 40th and feel so proud of the agency to have, you know, made it so long, I really want that birthday party to be a celebration for the community. Okay. So just really trying to encourage anyone who's ever volunteered or called oh, or participated in the organization yeah. to come that evening and just you know or, or if you're have just a, a supporter party. if Absolutely. you're somebody that supports the mission and the, the goals yeah. of the organization yeah. then, then come we'll have too. a band and oh, dance fun. and you know have and party hardy that's right. <laughs> that sounds like fun that sounds great mm -hmm. so that is you said it's uh, april 5th that's right 40th birthday party yeah see by the time you turn 40 you'll have already had already 40th know how birthday to do it. party yeah <laughs> <laughs> Do it all again. Yes. There's another one I know that I, I saw on your website called Bike Back the Night. Yes. Now that's not just local, is it? No. Um, there, it's actually, it's a Portland spin on Take Back the Night. Okay. And okay. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. And Take Back the Night has almost existed for 40 years as well. Oh, and that's wow. about That's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> that's about going, taking to the streets and really just saying that the streets need to be safe for everybody and that sexual violence needs to end. And we partner with the Portland State University Women's Resource Center. And so um, I think about five years ago, we started doing Bike Back the Night. So there's a march and a bike ride on April 25th, okay. starting at PSU. And it's really to raise awareness about sexual assault and to s basically say that we, don't, we want a community that's safe and we don't want people to experience sexual violence anymore. 
Is it a fundraiser or is it uh, awareness raiser? It's an it's awareness, purely raise. yeah, oh, purely right. to raise awareness. And it's actually, it's really fun. Um, we ride from PSU through the East Bank Esplanade. So it's oh, yeah. somewhat and that's of a fun short, ride. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. not that huge ride. It's, yeah. you know, a, a beginner rider could certainly right. do it. Right. Um, and it's just I really fun. <laughs> yes, you could <laughs> yeah, definitely could do, it. do it. And it's um, just a fun way to be with other people. And we usually have, um, before the event, we have some good speakers and performance. Um, we've had the, uh, oh my goodness, I'm not going to remember their name, but it's a group of synchronized bike Oh. Synchronized dancers that they use bikes really and dance, yeah. Regular bicycles or are they? They're like little, they're or? little BMX. Oh, like oh little yeah, yeah. Bikes, oh, And so okay. they like do tricks on their bikes. Oh, I wish I could remember their name. Yeah. Um, well, I, will it be on your website eventually? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and yeah, so people really want to know fun. they can follow up there, right? Right. <laughs> and that is. Uh, www.pwcl.org. That's right. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Now. Um, <laughs> You work with uh, human trafficking issues. I mean, that's kind of part of it. Do you get involved in that at all? Well, we do in a way. So sort of indirectly, we d we work with every survivor who who calls us, mm -hmm. and um, with a lot of the information coming out around human trafficking, a lot of that focus has been on minor victims of sex trafficking, mm -hmm. and that's actually something that we don't do that we don't work on ourselves. I mean, youth may call us who have experienced that, and we would help them. But there are other programs in the Portland metro area that are focused on. Minor victims of sex right. trafficking, but we like do Janice. I think Janice Youth Janice Services Youth has and a division that does that. Center, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you do referrals. Then. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But one of our advocates specializes in working with adults impacted by the sex industry, and so when one of the what she does is she works with folks who are engaged in commercial sex who are adults, um, and sometimes they're needing help to to leave the industry. Sometimes they're needing help to stay safe doing the work that they do, and mm -hmm. so her job is really, again, to kind of help folks maximize their safety, but then also to help other agencies kind of gain better competency in working with mm -hmm. sex workers, because a lot of times if a sex worker goes into a nonprofit and seeks services, there's a lot of shame and judgment about the work that they say, do. I was gonna say, I yeah. imagine it would be difficult as somebody who would be a sex worker to, to be able to go and say, this is what I do, right. and and not be, you know, be I'd be afraid of being yeah. judged and um, you know, unfairly judged yeah. because you know, I, I think a lot of people are not in that because uh, that's their first choice right. for a career, yeah. you know. So we work uh, with a lot of people who um, in, who trade sex for their basic needs, a place mm -hmm. to sleep, mm -hmm. food to eat, mm -hmm. and so how, you know, and, and they might not even identify as a sex worker, but that right. is how they kind of survive. Yeah. Um, so we're they helping do what them. they think is their only option. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, yeah. a lot of, you know, especially homeless women are very vulnerable to sexual violence and, sure. and yeah. having to, you know, having to exchange sex for their basic needs. Right. Yeah. Um, we're almost out of time, but tell me, um, we touched briefly on, um, oh, we have, before, I, before we stop, <laughs> we do have a, um, a public service announcement that I want to show right at the end Great. as we Thank close you. because that's a, that's a good, it's it's very short, but it's very powerful, mm -hmm. and I and I like that uh, that PSA. But um, we talked real briefly about men, or you know, you know, other than women, that you know, and that could be transgender. I imagine right. you know. Mm -hmm. um, do you find it's easier for for um, you know men to to come forward and to to call you for for help? I'm not sure. Because it I seems like it's still kind mm -hmm. of a. There's still yeah. some shame in that, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know what we know is that men are abused within their relationships with other men. Uh -huh. um, and so there's, there and could for, be additional. And with women, too. Absolutely. Yeah. They may be abused by women as well. Yeah. So um, there is some shame in it. And resources are harder to come by. So uh -huh. if you're a man looking for shelter, there are local shelters that accept male survivors. Um, but it's that's somewhat new. Okay. So, but um, they can call you. And absolutely. you can do the referrals and, yes. and help them yeah. out. Yeah. Okay. And we provide case management to male okay. survivors as well. Good. Yeah. Good. Anything else that we need to know before I let you go here? Well, of course, I'd love folks to come to Safety in Numbers and to Bike Back so the open Night. To, open to the public. Absolutely. Yep. All ages party on the 5th. Um, and then, you know, and just encouraging people to check us out because you, what we know is that when survivors need help, they're more likely to go to their friends and family. Mm. And so we can be a resource to friends and family as well who want to know how to support survivors in their life. Great. Very yeah. well said. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rebecca. And thanks yeah, for being absolutely. my guest here tonight. Thanks. So if you're interested in finding out more about the Portland Women's Crisis Line, be sure to check out their website. The information should be on your screen. And if you're interested in supporting the organization, you can go to their party and have a great time and support them at the same time. Or if you just want to be a part of it and uh, show your support, do the bike back 
the night. Yep. Thanks so much for watching our show tonight. This is Community Hotline. I'm Monica Weitzel. We'll see you next week. If you're a victim of rape or abuse, you might feel all alone. But out of 100 women and girls, 20 have been raped. 100 couples, 25 partners battered or abused. 100 men and boys, 10 sexually assaulted. But if you don't know who to call, or you're scared or embarrassed, you might feel alone. But you're not. PWCL, a crisis line for women, men, and youth. Understanding. Helping. Confidence.